Fear and faith are two subjects that you often find together. In fact, sometimes you see them as opposites and sometimes as companions. That may sound a little strange, but that's the way it is in the scriptures. We are told that there are those who fear things around them. And we're going to be looking at a a, uh, passage that speaks of the disciples fearing the waves that they see around them. But then we are called to fear God. And that that fear is actually, is actually faith. It's confidence in our God. A delight in Him. We're going to be looking then at Mark chapter 4, verses 35 through uh, the end of the chapter, 41 where we have this event where the disciples are with Jesus out on a boat and they're hit by a storm. Now this is the first of three consecutive uh, scenes where fear and faith are mentioned. As we go on from here, uh, they're going across the Sea of Galilee to the eastern shore, and when they get there, there's a madman that comes rushing down toward them. A man who is filled with with demons. And when Jesus sends the demons out into a herd of pigs, and they rush down into into the water and are drowned, people fear. People are afraid. And they tell Jesus, get out of here. We don't want you. But the man, of course, is healed because... The demons have been taken away from him. And he is a man then who is of great faith. History uh, gives us a a view of him as a man who started churches in that area then, some of whom were represented at the Council of Nicaea. Whether that's true or not, we we don't have assurance, but nevertheless, he was a man of of faith as is indicated by that uh, event. And then as Jesus comes back to the, to the western shore of the Sea of Galilee, he is met by a man who is the, the uh, uh, ruler of a synagogue, and his daughter is dying. And he asks Jesus to come and heal her. And Jesus is a, uh, this man is afraid that she's going to die at any time. And in fact, he gets news that she does die while Jesus is, is uh, taking time away to talk to a lady who has been ill for a dozen years with a flow of blood. And he says to the man, do not fear, only believe. So there's a great emphasis here on fear and faith that is given to us in this passage. And we're going to be looking at, uh, at uh, how Christ is one who drives us to, un- to faith, not to be fearful, but he drives out fear in or- because he is the one who is sovereign over all creation. So for our scripture lesson, we'll read verses 35 through 41 of Mark chapter 4. Hear the word of the Lord. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. 
May God bless to us the reading of this portion of his holy word and teach us as we consider it together before him this morning. We're going to be looking at this through the questions that are asked here. First, there's first of all that question that the disciples ask of Jesus as he is, as they wake him up there on the boat, and you can imagine how furious they are, how, how excited they are because of all the, the storm that is all around them. And then there are the questions that Jesus asks of the disciples, two of them that we'll get, uh, deal with together. But before we deal with those, we'll look at the third one that is asked in this passage, which is also asked by the disciples. Why are you, uh, uh, who then is this that even the wind and sea obey him? But first of all, Lord, do you not care that we are perishing? That's literally the word that is used there, perishing. <clears throat> And I have to agree with Sinclair Ferguson when he wrote that this is the cruelest question they could have asked him. Think about it. What did Jesus come to do? He came to deliver us from perishing. I would imagine that most of you have memorized the verse that indicates that. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not, what? Perish, but have everlasting life. And it's exactly the same word that John gives us in John 3.16 that Mark gives us right here. He came to keep us from perishing. In fact, he had demonstrated that. He's been demonstrating that to the disciples all through the ministry that they've had up to this point because he has been healing the sick, he's been destroying or, or sending out demons and doing other miracles, one of which that you, you find back in the first chapter of Mark where a, uh, a leper comes to him and asks Jesus to heal him. If you're willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus touches him. Now, normally we would expect that under the Old Testament law to make him unclean, but instead it is cleanness that goes from Jesus to the leper instead of uncleanness from the leper to Jesus. And as the disciples have witnessed these things, they should be able to understand that yes, he came to deliver us from perishing, to keep us from perishing, so that we would have everlasting life. Now let's think about this situation where they're on the ship, uh, on the boat, as they're trying to cross this lake, which is called a sea, the Sea of Galilee. Did you notice whose idea it was to go on this voyage? Yes, you have Peter and John and others who were fishermen. You might expect them to be the ones who would say, let's go. But they're not going on a fishing expedition. It's Jesus himself who says, let's get on the boat and go to the other side. It was his idea. It wasn't the disciples' idea. Do you think he knew about the storm that was about to come on them? Of course he did. Of course he knew about that storm because this was a time of testing for them. He was testing their faith. Will they trust him? Will they be confident in him to do what is right? We all face trials in life of various kinds. Maybe, we, maybe the car breaks down in the middle of the night and you don't have anybody around and you wonder, how in the world am I going to get through this? Some big expense comes and you weren't prepared for it. All sorts of trials that come our way. And brothers and sisters, 
those trials are given to us and are used in us by both Satan and Christ with different purposes. Satan is trying to destroy us. Satan is trying to destroy our faith and to say that we, we can't make it. We can't get through life. That's what temptations are for. It's for him to try to destroy us. Whereas the same event is a test by God. God does not tempt us, but he does test us. And this was a test that God was given to the disciples. Are you going to trust me? As you see that I'm able to sleep here on this cushion at the back of the boat, why can't you? Jesus does not tempt us to, to evil, but he tests us to show the greatness, the, the blessing that there is in having faith in him. And having confidence in him and being and knowing that he does all things well. The disciples should know that as he has already cast out demons, as he has already healed the sick, as he has already raised lepers, that we need to confess him as Lord, as the one who be, will be providing for us and will, will carry us through life. A psalm that, uh, as I grew up, we, we sang the psalms. And one psalm that we often sang, and you could almost guarantee that we'd sing it if, you, if we were going on a trip or sending someone away on a trip. I remember especially us singing it at the bus station when my sister got on the bus to go away to college. Psalm 121. He will not allow your foot to slip. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. You see, there's the confession that we are to make in, in our covenant with Christ. To recognize that he is the one who will keep us from from uh, suffering beyond what we're able to endure. Jesus has already done these things. And the disciples are still worried because they haven't come to, to trust him as the one who will provide for them in, in, in the midst of the storm. <clears throat> now, would we have done any differently from, than what the disciples did? I'll let you answer that for yourself. But you see, we have a responsibility to confess him as our God, as the one who does provide for us, as the one who does not slumber or sleep. The title for this sermon, Why Are You Sleeping?, is a, is a question that is asked in a number of different ways in Scripture. And it's asked in two directions. One regarding God, why are you sleeping? The disciples wonder why Jesus is able to sleep at this time. But then it's also asked from God to us. Why are you sleeping? Why is your faith not there? Why is it not strong? And that's what he's calling us to, rest in, to do in resting in him. But let's go on to another of the questions. It's actually the last question that's given to us in our text. But the one we want to consider next. Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Now, one of the things that Mark mentions at the beginning of his gospel account is his purpose is to show that Jesus is the Son of God. That's in the opening verse of Mark. And we don't have the Son of God as a title for Jesus often in this book. In fact, I think it's only three times. But there's this, the last time is at the conclusion of the book. 
No, it's not chapter 16, but it is 15, where Jesus has died on the cross. And the centurion is there, and he says, truly, this man was the Son of God. Now, what does that title mean? Well, it means that he is God. As fully as the Father is God, so we make that confession that Jesus is God. And he has the same authority that the Father has. He is the Lord of all creation. He was there at the beginning. He is the Word. And so as he spoke, the earth came into being. As he spoke, each day took place. And he accomplished his purpose. Because, you see, he has that authority over all creation. And so when we come now to to this passage where he has been with the disciples in the middle of this storm and they have wakened him and wondered why in the world he is able to sleep in the midst of this storm, don't you care that we're perishing? What does he do? He gets up and first of all, very kindly, He could have asked the question, where's your faith? But instead, he first says very kindly, hush, be still. And it was still. That's the authority he has over the creation. Now, you parents might have times when you want to say to your children, hush, be still. And yet they aren't necessarily going to be still. But that's the authority that Christ has. And we can see that in many places. For example, we sang from uh, Psalm 46, Be still and know that I am God. Quit your striving, quit your struggling, and recognize that I am God. And know that I am God, even in the midst of the storm. Earlier in Mark's gospel account, in uh, in fact, in the first chapter, there was a man who was demon-possessed. And that demon-possessed man then was brought to Jesus, and Jesus, it says, rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. Out of here. And the demon is gone. We often wish we had that authority, don't we? It's a good thing we don't. But Jesus has that authority because he is the son of God. And so his be still is an expression of his authority as God. There is nothing that is beyond his control. There is nothing that is beyond his authority. He is able to command all creation by his word. My father was a pastor and there was a man, there there was a couple who uh, was asleep at night and there was a storm and the, uh, the wife was saying to her husband, as they slept on the second floor, or tried to sleep on the second floor, I think we need to go to the basement. Well, he didn't think they needed that. She said, well, I'm going to the basement. And he ultimately said, okay, happy wife, happy life. And so he headed downstairs, and he looked up and saw the sky. God had opened up the roof. But he got them out before it came crashing down on them. Many of you can testify to similar kinds of events in your own lives. Things that have happened where you recognize the authority of Christ who stills the storms and holds them off so that they don't destroy us until we have finally heard him and done what he has called us to do. Psalm 24, 
the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. That includes you and me. That includes this building. That includes the cars that we drive. That includes all that we have in our homes. He is an authority over those things. And they are to be used for his glory. And we recognize that he has this authority over all creation that he has given, he has that authority and he exercises it for the church as Paul noted to the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 1. This is the authority of Christ. And don't think that that authority is any less in 2022 AD than it was 2,000 years ago. It is still his authority. The Son of God does not sleep, but he cares for you. And so we don't need to be scared of the storms that he brings. But we know that he's the one who leads us even into the midst of the storms. Now that's a difficult thing for many Christians. I remember mentioning, I mentioned this not long ago, uh, to a congregation, and there was a, uh, one young lady in particular who did not like what I had to say. That, for example, COVID is no surprise to God. Indeed, he has appointed it for his own glory. Now, yes, there are secondary causes for that. There are secondary causes for the th trials that we run into. Maybe it's our foolishness. Maybe, maybe it's uh, uh, what others are doing to us. Nevertheless, as the prophet in Lamentations chapter 3 says, is it not from the hand of the Lord that both good and ill go forth? That doesn't make him the author of evil. But he brings these things in, into our lives to test us while Satan tries to tempt us to evil. But Jesus is testing us in order that we might draw near to him and, and uh, come to enjoy him all the more. We should not be terrified by his leading us into the storms. We sang a portion of Psalm 107 earlier a portion that talked about the kind of thing that the disciples were going through as they were out on the Sea of Galilee and this storm arose and God brought them safely to the other side. If we were to go on from that portion of Psalm 107, we get to what I call the climate change psalm. Now that may surprise some of you. But let me note what else he has to say in that psalm as you go beyond those, those uh, little scenes that he has given to us. They, we come to Psalm 107, beginning with, with verse 33. He, notice that's an important pronoun here. He, that is the Lord God, changes rivers into wilderness. He does it. And springs of water into thirsty ground. A fruitful land into a salt waste. Why? Because of the wickedness of those who dwell in it. But then there's the flip side in verse 35. He changes wilderness into a pool of water and a dry land into springs of water. And there he makes the hungry to dwell so that they may establish an inhabited city and go on and live as God would have them to live. There is a great deal of fear today because of climate change. And that is a bit of fear that is being placed on us, but 
When we recognize that Jesus is the Son of God, we must recognize that he has authority over this. He is the one who brings climate change in either direction. We do not need to fear climate change. We need to fear the Son of God. Now, if you want to say that we cause it, okay, I'll go along with it. Just as we read there, it's because of the sins of the people who are there. We bring about, we can bring about climate change or cause God to bring that about because of our foolishness, because of our sinfulness, because we have not fulfilled our covenant obligations to him. Who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? He is the Son of God. And he is the one in whom we are to have confidence. So then, there are these other two questions that Jesus asks, and they belong together, and we take them together. Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? Why are you so afraid? What is it that is fearful about the trials that shouldn't be fearful for us? It's because we look at the trials rather than at the one who is sovereign over the trials. Just uh, if we go back to Matthew, there's another trip across the... the uh, the Sea of Galilee, it's not the return trip uh, of this same voyage, but it's, it's a later one. After the feeding of the 5,000, there's another storm. And that storm is tossing them about, but Jesus this time is not in the boat with them. He's back on the, on the hill after feeding the 5,000, praying. And then he comes walking towards them. And they get scared because they think it's a ghost. They don't know what to think. And then he says, of course, it's, look, here I am. Don't you know who I am? Don't be afraid. Oh, phew. Well, Lord, if it's you, says Peter, let me come and walk over to you like you're doing on the water. And so he steps out of the boat as Jesus bids him to come. And he starts walking toward Jesus. And I wouldn't be surprised if he'd say, wait till I tell my grandsons about this. I walked on water. But then he looks off to the side and sees the waves. And he begins to sink. And that's really a paradigm for, for our, us in our trials. It's when we look at Jesus that we, have, that we are strengthened to carry through those trials and to endure them. But when we look at the trials themselves and see the storm raging, that's when we run into trouble. That's when we start to sink. That's when we lose our ability to do what God would have us do. We are to call upon him in faith, knowing that he will not allow us to perish. Oh, how wonderful it is for us to be able to have that confidence that, that he is God and that he cares for us. I have said to some people that I'd love to be able to preach after I turn 100. But if I don't make it that far, all the better because I'll be with him. Do you have that view of Christ that you long to be with him? You know that it's, it's better off with him? Suppose you were in a Muslim country and were arrested with a number of other Christians, were blindfolded and taken out to a pit, and you know exactly what's going to happen. They're going to come and slice your head off.
would you wish you could change your pants then? Or would everything be fine? Would you recognize that what you have in front of you in Christ is wonderful? Because you're going to be with him where there are no storms, where there is no tear, there is no sorrow, but there is only the joy of being with Christ. Oh, what glory there is for us as we come to him. And so we call on him who will not allow us to perish. We call on him out of faith. And we need to have our, our prayers more and more geared in that direction. That we will call upon him out of faith. That we will magnify his name. I believe it was Derek Thomas from whom I first heard the, the phrase organ recital prayers. I don't know if you've heard that phrase or not, but a lot of prayers are organ recitals. You know, bless Aunt Tilly's heart and so and so, Uncle Joe's liver, etc. Heal them. And that's all we're focused on getting, getting to have everything we want. We read about Peter being in prison and how people had, jo had uh, joined together in prayer at the home of John Mark's mother and that they were praying. And we assume, typically, that they're praying for Peter's release, and he is released. I'm not convinced that that's what they were praying for. I believe that they were praying for Peter, that he would remain firm in his faith, that he would not give up his faith or, or turn away from anything that God had uh, given him, but that he would remain faithful unto death, knowing that God has provided the crown of life. Now, it's not wrong to pray for their healing. I don't mean that at all. But if that's our only focus, rather than the glory of God, which is our purpose in life, our, our, our longing. Our prayers ought to be for us to rest in him who does not sleep. There's an event that takes place late in the Gospels. Jesus had taken his disciples with him, and then he took three of them and went a little further, and he had them, had those three, he leaves them by themselves and says, Watch and pray that you don't enter into temptation. And then Jesus goes off by himself and prays, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Do you remember what he said to Peter when he came back? Are you sleeping? Why are you sleeping? Could you not even pray with me for one hour? Now, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands as to how many of you have prayed for a whole Hour. But you see, Jesus says that to Peter as if he expects it from him. And no, I don't mean to say that we should somehow covenant before God that we're going to pray for an hour every day. I mean, if you can do that, that's great. But you see, God is expecting us to be calling upon him because he has drawn us into this covenant with himself as we've been noting with, throughout this service and bringing us to walk in obedience to him and to enjoy being with him. We talk about union and communion with Christ. We are united to him through faith in Christ and that's something that does not change if you believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you are trusting in Him, then that's wonderful. You are there forever. Unless that is a faith that is uh, false. Let me encourage you children to trust in Jesus Christ, to be glad in Him, to know that He is the one who will care for you. 
and to have this kind of faith that he calls us to have. It's what we as adults are to do as well. To be confident in him. But now, Jesus was here chiding Peter. Could you not watch with me for one hour? Do you love that kind of fellowship with God that one hour would be wonderful? We sleep. But he does not sleep while you encounter the storms. We come through those trials because he is gracious. He is merciful. And so he provides for us. We encounter life storms when it seems that he is sleeping, but he really isn't. <clears throat> we are to cast out fear by this truth that we know that he is not sleeping, even though I have no idea where the next meal is going to come from, or I have no idea how I'm going to pay for the repairs on our car so that we can get to work and do the things that we need to do, or to fix the house, or whatever the trial may be. Be confident that he knows and he is not sleeping, but that he calls us to this faith in him. Let the appearance of his sleeping be something that awakens you to the fact that, yes, he is watching. Perhaps that seems like a trick, that he would be sleeping or he appears to sleep when he isn't. But he's actually calling you to awaken from your sleep. That you might, with confidence in him, be filled with faith and honor him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we know that you do not sleep. We know that you are in authority over all things. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would be glorified in us, that we might enjoy you, enjoy being with you, knowing, being confident that you have not left us, but that you continue to care for us. So, Heavenly Father, when it seems that you're sleeping, make us to remember to remember that you never slumber nor sleep in watching over us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> now we come to the receiving.